Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you back to Chatsworth, a magnificent and historic house in central England, for part two of our guided tour around this wonderful stately home. In my last video, we explored the ground floor and the state apartments, and today we're going to continue our exploration of the house and visit the remaining rooms that are open to the public. As usual, there'll be a selection of lovely photographs for you to look at on the accompanying slideshow, and once again they've been provided by the photographer Simon Wilkinson, whose work you can also find on Flickr. I'll put a link to his portfolio in the description below the video. You can admire his photos of the house as we go along on our tour, or you can look at them another time, so that right now you can just settle down, close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to part two of our tour of Chatsworth House. You may recall that at the end of part one of our tour, we just finished exploring the old master drawings cabinet, which was the final room in the wing of the house that was built by the first Duke of Devonshire at the end of the 17th century. We're going to continue now by walking through into a later part of the house, the sketch galleries, which were built in the 19th century by the sixth Duke of Devonshire to connect up the different sections of the house by a more direct route. Today, each of these sketch galleries is devoted to a specific theme, and when we wander into the first one, the South Sketch Gallery, we'll find displays relating to one of the Cavendish family's most interesting ancestors, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire. In the 18th century, Georgina was a style icon. I suppose you could say she was a key influencer of her day. Uh, she was a hugely fashionable socialite and celebrity who was famous for her dashing dress sense and for her patronage of the leading artists, scientists and politicians of the day. She was born in 1757 at Althorpe which is the country seat of the Spencer family. Her father was the first Earl Spencer, and many people have drawn parallels between Georgina and a more recent daughter of the Spencer clan, who was also a style icon in her time, Diana, Princess of Wales. Like Diana, Georgina made what was, on paper at least, a very advantageous marriage, at a very young age. In 1774, when she was just 17 years old, she married William Cavendish, the fifth Duke of Devonshire, who at the time was one of the wealthiest and most eligible men in England. He was considered to be the most marvellous catch. However, Georgina quickly found out that she had little in common with her new husband. Temperamentally, they weren't really suited at all. She was a passionate, artistic and quite spontaneous person, whereas the Duke was far more reserved, not particularly imaginative, and, uh, like many men of his class, quite emotionally inhibited. However, also like many men of his class, the Duke was prone to taking mistresses, and believed that it was his absolute right to do so. He kept many of his early conquests discreetly low-key, but in 1787 he began an affair with a woman who would have a profound impact on his marriage and on the reputation of both himself and his wife. The woman in question was Lady Elizabeth Foster, who was known as Bess, and she first met the Cavendishes as a couple, while they were holidaying in Bath. And in fact, initially, it was Georgina 
who she attached herself to. She quickly insinuated herself with the Duchess and became her closest friend. However, at the same time, she was also angling to become the mistress of the Duke, which she soon did. Georgina only discovered the affair when Bess announced to her that she was pregnant with the Duke's child. Ah, uh, but by that time, she'd already moved in with the couple, and she would continue to live with them in a sort of ménage à trois arrangement for the next 25 years, which of course generated an awful lot of shock and society gossip, because while it was expected for members of the aristocracy to have affairs, the hypocrisy of the era meant that they were always supposed to keep them behind closed doors. Georgina coped with this triangular development in her marriage by taking lovers herself, most notably the Whig peer and future Prime Minister, Earl Grey. However, she also rather unfortunately took to dissipating her sorrows in alcohol, laudanum and gambling, to which she became addicted. Consequently, she tends to be best remembered today as a fashionable but rather tragic figure of scandal. And this reputation was solidified in 2008, thanks to a period costume film that was made about her, called The Duchess. The film is very sumptuous, beautiful to look at, well acted, and is sympathetic to the plight of Georgina. However, I feel it did her rather a disservice because it focused very heavily on her private life and largely ignored her many other achievements which were considerable. Georgina was very active in the fields of politics, literature and science. And while there is one scene in the film where she's shown attending a political husting, this is framed very much within the context of a romantic interlude with Lord Grey, whereas in reality, Georgina was an enthusiastic political activist. She campaigned regularly and passionately on behalf of the Whig Party, and she genuinely believed in the fairly radical ideas for reform that the Whigs embodied at the time. She was also a prolific writer, both of prose and poetry, and she published two novels during her lifetime. She was also a keen amateur scientist. She made her own in-depth studies of mineralogy. She became a patron of the physician and chemist Charles Blagden, and she played a key role in setting up the Pneumatic Institute in Bristol with the scientist Thomas Beddoes. So there was far more to her, really, than just a fashionable, scandalous socialite. And Georgina's wider interests are represented at Chatsworth by her collection of minerals and fossils, which now reside in the South Sketch Gallery in an elegant glass-fronted cabinet. There are also several portraits of her to be found in this room. Because she was such an undisputed queen of fashion, she was painted by many of the great artists of her day, and we'll find paintings here by two of the great masters of the era, Sir Joshua Reynolds and Thomas Gainsborough. However, my favourite depiction of the Duchess in the South Sketch Gallery is a portrait of her by the artist Mariah Cosway, which shows her as the goddess Cynthia, striding forth out of the heavens. Cynthia was the name given to the classical goddess Diana by the poet Edmund Spencer in his poem The Fairy Queen. And Spencer describes Cynthia as lulling his senses with the wonder of her beamers bright. Cosway interpreted this line of the poem by showing Georgina bursting forth in beams of brilliance out of a dark and cloudy sky. She's wearing the moon diadem of the goddess Diana on her head, and she's looking directly out of the canvas, straight at the viewer. 
with an expression of complete fearlessness and radiance. It's a portrait that's full of life, power and exhilaration. And it shows Georgina as she was as a young woman of 25, glowing, joyful and in full possession of her confidence, as she must have been in the years before she became mired in addiction, scandal and the toxic friendship of Lady Elizabeth Foster. Once we've finished admiring Georgina's portrait, we can move on from the South Sketch Gallery and walk through into the West Sketch Gallery. This has displays dedicated to the third Earl of Burlington, who wasn't a direct member of the Cavendish family, but became related to it through the marriage of his youngest daughter, Charlotte, to the fourth Duke of Devonshire. The Earl was a prodigious collector, as well as being an amateur architect of some note, and he was given the nickname of the Apollo of the Arts, because he had such discerning taste and a brilliantly cultured eye. By the time of his death in 1753, he'd amassed an impressive array of paintings and artefacts. And because he had no sons, they were inherited by his daughter Charlotte, and so passed into the ownership of the Cavendishes. Several pieces of his collection are on display here in the West Sketch Gallery, including a very animated marble bust of the architect Inigo Jones. And nearby there's also a portrait of the Earl of Burlington, which was painted by the artist George Napton, and which rather charmingly shows the same sculpture of Jones in the background of the painting. As I mentioned before, the two sketch galleries we've now visited were created by the 6th Duke of Devonshire in the 19th century. However, we can now walk through into a third sketch gallery, the North Sketch Gallery, which was created far more recently. This was actually made as part of a refurbishment of the house by the current Duke of Devonshire and his wife in 2008, and the gallery was created by converting a series of small service rooms that formerly ran along the north side of the house. So now there's a new third sketch gallery, and rather appropriately, it's dedicated to a far more recent family member, the 11th Duke of Devonshire, who was the current Duke's father. Like many of his ancestors, the 11th Duke was an enthusiastic patron of the arts, and in 1959, he befriended a young and then unknown artist and commissioned him to paint a portrait of his wife, Deborah. The painting in question now hangs in the North Sketch Gallery, and it's extremely striking. It arrests the eye as soon as you walk past it, mainly because it's so unlike most conventional portraits that are made of the aristocracy. It's a close-up of the head of Deborah, the 11th Duchess, and it's by no means a conventional, flattering society piece. It has a raw, expressive style, with bold brushwork and muted colours that's both intense and compelling, as well it might be, because the young artist who painted it in the late 1950s was no other than Lucian Freud, who would of course go on to become one of the most celebrated painters of the 20th century. At the far end of the North Sketch Gallery, we can turn right and step into a suite of bedrooms which are used when guests come to stay at Chatsworth. Today, these rooms are known simply as the guest bedrooms, but when I first started visiting the house, quite a few years ago now, they were known back then as the Scott Rooms, in recognition of the fact that back in the 16th century, Mary Queen of Scots stayed in these rooms while she was under house arrest. 
Bess of Hardwick, whose life we heard about in part one of our tour, was at this time living at Chatsworth House with her fourth husband, the Earl of Shrewsbury. And the Earl was commissioned by the Queen, Elizabeth I, to guard her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, after she had been arrested for treason. The ill-fated Scottish Queen would spend some years residing at Chatsworth, although the rooms she lived in were completely remodelled in the 19th century, and so they no longer bear any traces of her presence. This is perhaps why today the rooms have been renamed, and each of them has a little card on its door bearing the name of a former guest who has stayed there. The first bedroom we'll enter bears the name of the Marquis and Marchioness of Normanby, and it's a delightfully cosy room, very inviting indeed, with deep red walls and beautiful floral-patterned chintz curtains. Rather cleverly, the curtains are kept closed in order to create a sense of how the room would look in the evening when its occupant was relaxing or getting ready for dinner, and several table lamps are lit around the room in order to give it a lovely warm evening glow. There's an elegant four-poster bed, which is also decorated with chintz hangings and upholstery, and at the end of the bed there's a graceful writing desk, as well as a dressing table by the window, a comfortable-looking armchair by the fireplace, and even a walk-in ensuite bath that has been built into a cupboard opposite the bed. Taken altogether, this bedroom appears to be furnished with absolutely everything a guest could require during their visit, and it's certainly a room that I wouldn't mind settling down into for the evening. Next door to the Normanby bedroom, there's an interconnecting dressing room, which is furnished with a single mahogany sleigh bed, dressed with a lovely circular canopy that's also hung with the same striking floral chintz fabric that we saw in the main bedroom. However, the most eye-catching decorative feature in this little room isn't the bed, but rather the wallpaper, which is an exquisite hand-painted Chinese design. It features a delicate pattern of leafy white bamboo trees, which are set against a vivid jade green background, and the paper also features beautiful sprays of pink and purple flowers, and a variety of colourful birds that flit airily between the bamboo branches. It was the sixth Duke of Devonshire, the Bachelor Duke, whom we heard about in part one of our tour, who was responsible for refurbishing the guest bedrooms and adding this delightful wallpaper. In the next two rooms, we'll find further examples of his taste for chinoiserie, firstly in the Wellington bedroom and then in the Wellington dressing room. These two interconnecting chambers are, of course, named after the Duke of Wellington, who came to stay at Chatsworth in 1843, when he accompanied Queen Victoria and Prince Albert on a visit to the house. In the main Wellington bedroom, there's a gorgeously colourful wallpaper depicting intensely green bamboo trees on a cream background, while in the adjoining dressing room, the paper features more muted bamboo trees and leaves against a soft shade of blue. However, both papers feature a further variety of exotic birds and flowers, and both rooms also feature the same combination of a double bed in the main bedroom and a single canopy bed in the dressing room. Both of the beds are draped with a rather splendid green and gold silk, and apparently these hangings originally began life as curtains and, in an early instance of recycling, were repurposed as bed coverings in the 1960s. The final guest bedroom we'll visit is the Leicester Room, 
which is named after Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester. If you're a fan of Tudor history, you'll already know that Dudley was a soldier and a statesman who also happened to be the favourite of Queen Elizabeth I, and who was consequently at one time one of the most powerful men in England. The Earl visited Chatsworth in 1577, although again, like Mary Queen of Scots, there's nothing really left to associate him with this room, because like the other guest rooms, it was refurbished by the Sixth Duke. It now features another gorgeous chinoiserie wallpaper scheme, however it doesn't have a canopy hanging over the double bed, and this is apparently because Evelyn, who was the ninth Duchess of Devonshire, had the original bed hangings removed from the room because she felt they were unsanitary and could cause bad sore throats. So today the rather handsome gilded bed frame isn't dressed with bed hangings and is only covered with a simple, but I must say very sumptuous looking, crimson damask bedspread, as well as a few comfortable looking cushions. The guest bedrooms are the final set of rooms to explore on the second floor of the house, so let's descend now down to the first floor by walking down the oak stairs, a sturdy wooden staircase that is lit from overhead by a large domed skylight and which has high walls covered with paintings of the previous Dukes of Devonshire as well as their friends and family. In the centre of one wall, we can see another portrait of Lord Burlington, this time surrounded by his family, while another, later painting, shows an equally charming family group of the Bateson sisters, who were the granddaughters of the 8th Duchess of Devonshire, and who were captured on canvas by the brilliant American society painter John Singer Sargent. Reaching the first floor of the house, we can turn into the anti-library, an elegant white and gold room, which will lead us through into the main library itself. This is a very long room, which began life as a gallery for taking indoor exercise, but which was transformed into a library by the Sixth Duke in order to house his overflowing book collection. The library contains several unique and rather marvellous treasures, including the prayer book of King Henry VII, which is a beautifully illustrated, illuminated manuscript, as well as a 1566 edition of Copernicus's seminal astronomy work on the revolutions of heavenly spheres. I absolutely adore this library. Quite apart from the fantastic book collection, it's also a wonderful room in its own right, because in spite of its large size, it's full of atmosphere and comfort. There's a white marble fireplace in the centre of the room, which is flanked by several cosy-looking sofas and armchairs, and I can easily imagine that when the fire's lit, it's just the perfect place for curling up with a good book. There's also a sumptuously patterned red Axminster carpet underfoot, which adds to the warm glow of the room, while overhead there's also a magnificent gold stuccoed ceiling. However, my absolute favourite feature of the room is a hidden spiral staircase that's concealed behind a fake bookcase, and which leads up to the beautiful balustraded gallery that runs halfway up the library wall and allows access to the uppermost bookcases. Knowing that this library contains such an intriguing secret only adds to its charm. As you've probably gathered, I could quite happily spend all day in this room. But let's retrace our steps now, back through the anti-library and walk into the dome room, which also features a fabulous gilded stucco ceiling, 
as well as some rather grand marble columns. On my last visit to Chatsworth, the dome room was the setting for two rather eye-catching exhibits. A bronze sculpture of the Greek god Hermes and an iconic portrait of the king Henry VIII. Let's begin by looking at Hermes, who rises up from his plinth at the centre of the room and who is portrayed in an impressively athletic pose. He is standing on one leg, with one hand carrying his winged staff, and the other hand pointing upwards to the sky, presumably towards the gods on Mount Olympus. Meanwhile, the painting of Henry VIII is a copy of a now lost portrait of the king by Hans Holbein the Younger, which originally lived at the Palace of Whitehall in London, but which was sadly destroyed by a fire there in 1698. The copy at Chatsworth was probably commissioned by Sir William Cavendish, the husband of Bess of Hardwick, and it shows the young Henry at the height of his powers, wearing a magnificently embroidered doublet, and looking every inch like the infamous Tudor monarch, who married six wives and beheaded two of them. Walking past Henry and Hermes, we can leave the dome room behind and step through into the great dining room. As might be inferred from the name, this room was designed for hosting grand dinner parties, and the first one that was held here was in honour of a visit from the then 13-year-old Princess Victoria, who would later become the Queen of Great Britain. Every part of this dining room glitters with opulence, from the red silk wall hangings to the heavily decorated white and gold ceiling and the vast chandelier that hangs below it and which holds approximately 2,400 glass drops. The dining table itself is also arrayed with a dazzling display of silverware that was commissioned by the sixth duke from Paul Storr the most prominent silver and goldsmith of the 19th century. Storr was well used to making splendid statement pieces for his wealthy clients, who also included two kings, George III and George IV, as well as the famous admiral, Lord Nelson. The service Storr made for Chatsworth includes a range of cutlery, plate and chargers as well as a selection of elaborately decorated dishes, ewers, wine coolers, and some splendid candlesticks that make an impressive arrangement down the centre of the table. Every year, in the months after Christmas, when Chatsworth is closed to the public, the house stewards clean all the silver to ensure it stays bright and gleaming, and apparently... It takes them around 40 hours to complete the task. Let's move on now into the final room we'll visit today. The Sculpture Gallery. This was another part of the Sixth Duke's extension to the house, and he built it to house yet another part of his grand collection. His sculptures. The gallery is a long and lofty room, but in comparison to the grandeur we've seen in other parts of the house, this space is surprisingly plain in its decoration. There is a beautiful white plaster ceiling, which bears some graceful ornamentation and a large, elegant skylight. But apart from this, the rest of the room is quite simple in its design. Both the walls and the floor are made from plain gritstone, and this was a deliberate choice by the Duke, because although it's a rather basic material, the dull colour of the gritstone is perfect for setting off the white marble of the sculptures the room contains. At first glance, the statues and figures that grace this gallery appear to be of classical origin, but this is an illusion. Originally, the Sixth Duke had indeed intended to purchase a collection of authentic Greek and Roman antiquities. However, by the middle of the 19th century, the collecting of ancient sculptures 
had become such a fashionable pastime that there were very little antiquities left on the market for the Duke to buy. Undaunted, he turned instead to the contemporary artists of his own era and bought pieces that were created in the classical style from artists such as the renowned 19th century sculptor Canova. Consequently, while many of the sculptures in this gallery are inspired by classical figures, such as Achilles, Mars and Venus, some of them also depict celebrities from the 19th century, such as Napoleon Bonaparte and his sister, the Princess Pauline Borghese, and even their mother, Letizia. However, my favourite sculpture in this room doesn't depict a human figure at all, but rather a magnificent lion. It's one of a pair of enormous Leonine sculptures that were commissioned by the Sixth Duke from the artist Rinaldo Rinaldi after a pair of lions that had originally been carved by Canova for the tomb of Pope Clement XIII. One of the lions stares out from his plinth with quite a fierce expression. But the other one, the one I particularly love, shows the lion fast asleep with his gigantic head resting gently on top of his huge paws. It's a beautifully observed sculpture, with every dimple of the lion's whiskers lovingly rendered in white marble. And, unsurprisingly, it's one of the most popular pieces in the gallery. If we walk past the sleeping lion to the far end of the sculpture gallery, we can pass through a doorway into the former orangery, which has now been converted into a rather tempting gift shop. This brings our tour of Chatsworth House to its end. However, there's still a great deal to see outside in the gardens, because the grounds of the house are as beautiful and historic as the building itself, and there are many delightful and intriguing features to explore there. So, if you'd like me to return to Chatsworth one more time and lead you through the enchanting gardens, then please let me know in the comments section below the video. Perhaps in a future talk, we'll take a turn together past the Cascade, lose ourselves in the Chatsworth maze, or meander through the Serpentine Walk and discover all the beauties of the Chatsworth grounds. However, for now, it's time to draw our visit to a close, and I do hope you've enjoyed exploring this magnificent English house with me. I hope, too, that you can join me again soon for another ASMR adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.